उन्होंने अंग्रेजी में लिखी हुई सोनेट्स की फॉर्म में लिखी हुई युधिष्ठर और द्रौपदी पर एक बहुत लंबी नजम सुनाई और इट रिमाइंडेड मी ऑफ पैराज रॉस ये उतनी ही मुश्किल अंग्रेजी है जितनी मैं मिलते लिखते और उसी तरह की उदास था लेकिन दैट्स द टाइम व्हेन आई हर्ड दिस पोएट्री एंड मुझे याद है मैं वो भूला नहीं वो कुछ दो सोनेट्स जो उनका जो कॉन्फ्लिक्ट है युधिष्ठ का द्रौपदी का उसके बारे में किस तरह से लिखा था उन्हें और फिर बहुत दिन के बाद जब मुझे मौका मिला मैंने वो पूरी किताब उर्दू वर्ष में ट्रांसलेट की तर्जमा किया और पेश किया मैं किताब एंड दैट सॉन्ग आई नो हिम ओनली थ्रू बुक्स एंड मैनी अ बुक्स विच ही हेज रिटन और मुझे नहीं लगता वो अदीब हैं राइटर हैं और बड़े प्रोलिफिक राइटर और लिखते ही रहते हैं बस वो पता नहीं कैसे कर लेते हैं ये सारा और ये मालूम हुआ कि मतलब सरकार में भी हैं गवर्नमेंट के अहदों पर भी हैं वो अपने कौंसुलेट भी रहे हैं एम्बेसडर रहे हैं और क्या कुछ नहीं किया और उस बीच में उसके बावजूद वो किताबें लिखते रहते हैं कुछ जूनियर उर्दू शायरों का तर्जुमा भी करते हैं अंग्रेजी में <laughs> इस हाल में अब एक हिंदुस्तान की एक सोशल कंडीशन जो बदलती रहती है जो बदलती चली आ रही है उस पर वो नब्स पकड़े रहना और उस पर लिखना और उस पर जिक्र करना वो दो तीन किताबें जो मैं एक द ग्रेट इंडियन मिडिल क्लास बीइंग इंडियन एंड बिकमिंग इंडियन आर रिमार्केबल बुक्स and he has been contributing in preserving and explaining the indian culture aur usse kis tarah se sambhal liya jaye kaise usko sambhal ke bhi rakha ja sakta hai us par bhi likhi kitab hai aur uske ilawa maine jaise kaha kuch tarjume bhi karte hain lekin kuch research work karte rehte hain jisme unhone chanakya par bhi krishnapur krishnapur ki किताबें लिखी और उसके बाद ये किताब उनकी आदि शंकर शाह जो पढ़ी तो मैं सोचा ये वक्त के साथ साथ चलने वाला शख्स जो सोशल चेंजेस सामाजिक तब्दीलियां जो आती हैं उनको कैसे अपने अंदाज से बयान करता रहता है और ये किताब अब मैंने इसे बहरा रिलीज तो जरूर कर दी है पढ़ी भी है <laughs> कुछ समझ में भी आई और कुछ ऊपर से भी निकल गई <laughs> क्योंकि ना तो मैं मजहब को इतनी अच्छी तरह से जानता हूं और वो श्लोक और वो जो जिनके मतलब कुछ अब समझ में आए जो सुनते चले आए इतने अरसे से अब पता चला उनके रेफरेंस समझ में आए तो बड़ा अच्छा अंदाज हुआ बहुत अच्छा लगा और <laughs> पढ़ते हुए मैं एक जिक्र कर दू कि मेरा फेवरेट चैप्टर है वेयर ही एक्सप्लेन्स दी कॉस्मोस जहाँ हमारी पूरी यूनिवर्स के बारे में एंड थ्रू दो श्लोकस विच आर देयर इन राइटिंग ऑफ आदि शंकराचार्य तो वो कॉस्मोस वॉज माई वेरी वेरी फेवरेट सब्जेक्ट ऑफ उनके और ना ज़्यादा देर आपके बीच में वक्फा करने के साथ साथ ये कहूँ कुछ डेट्स कुछ फासले कुछ लाइट ईयर्स कुछ पढ़े थे कुछ नए समय में आए कुछ याद रहे और मुझे सिर्फ इतना कहने के कि कुछ दो मिसरे याद आ गए थे कि आठ ही मिलियन उम्र जमी की होगी शायद ऐसा एक अंदाज़ा है कुछ साइंसदानों का चार इशारिया छ फोर डेसीमल सिक्स चार इशारिया छ बरस तो गुजर चुके हैं तुमने कितनी देर लगा दी आने में और आकर किस मजहब और जात पात के फेर में पड़ी हो चलो चले बस तीन ही बिलियन साल बचे हैं बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया
Yes. Am I wrong? Yes. You know, we just have this, uh, this ability to say the most complex things in a very simple way. It's a real gift. Although I must admit it's some point where I don't get the language, but, but I still, you know, it, it does, especially in his poetry, it does that so beautifully. Incidentally, what uh, Tasneem didn't mention was that Bhavan has translated a lot of Gurdjassar poems into English. And, and there are lovely editions where you get the, the original and the translation next to each other. So that's something to look out for. <coughs> Incidentally, Bhavan is, uh, again, his uh, CV was too long for Tasneem to it would have taken the whole evening. But before we begin talking about the subject today, I want to know, how the hell do you manage to pack in so much in a day? You know, this man has been an ambassador, he's been a civil servant, he's been uh, a writer, a poet, a political advisor, cultural czar. Should I stop there? So, a renaissance man. And it's wonderful that uh, you managed to do so much. And perhaps you should tell us the secret of time management later. <laughs> the first question that one asks when you have this book is, why? Why did you write it now? Uh, because I, I associate you with more not material exactly, but more things of the earth rather than of the spirit. Therefore, it came as a surprise. Well, if anybody were to make an analysis of trying to find a single theme in the books I have written, it would take a considerable period of time. Because my first book was a biography of Mirza Bhai after which I did a book on the Havelis of Old Delhi. This is my 22nd book. So, <laughs> That's what I was saying. <laughs> then I wrote on Krishna. Then I wrote on the great Indian middle class, being Indian, becoming Indian, Chanakya ever. I wrote, the only novel I wrote is being made into a Bollywood film. It's called When Loss is Gained. I've translated Gurdar Sahib, Kefi Azmi, Atulia Vajpayee. Uh, I've written a book on the Kama Sutra. <laughs> uh, so there have been many books. And I think essentially there is a search to try and understand different aspects to which, of which we are limited as Indians, not necessarily as Hindus only, because my subjects deal with India as a whole and what is happening in India, at least my contemporary books. And you'll be surprised, Anil, even the Dalit was written from the point of view of understanding his times as much as understanding his poetry. So in that space, this book, or rather Adi Shankaracharya, fascinated fascinated me for two or three reasons, which I was mentioning earlier this evening. Firstly, his life itself. A man born in the 8th century in Kerala, in Kaladi, who takes Samadhi in Kedarna, and travels the length and breadth of this land by foot, not once but twice. And in the scope of that very short life of only 32 years, sets up the four muts or monasteries, which draw up the civilizational map of India as it was, and it remains today. Shingeri in the south, Dwarka in the west, Puri in the east, and Yoshimut in the north. He even goes to Srinagar. He goes to Srinagar and writes copiously. 
prefer was as you go into Advait, the Vedantic school of thought, and it's not the only school of thought in India. That in itself was a discovery which I'd like to talk about. But if you go into the Vedantic school of thought, the sheer compressed cerebral energy in trying to understand who we are and what is this world about. It's a question all of us in moments of reflection or when we pause from the avalanche of municipal concerns that rule our life, uh, when we pause or think, it's a question that confronts us. Why? To what avail? To what goal? To what purpose? To what end? Is there anything beyond the contingent, the immediate, the qualified, the conditioned? Or is there something more? And what is fascinating is that in large parts of Hindu philosophy, they are not Srishti Chintaks. They are not examining the empirical world. Adi Shankaracharya and many others were Paramarthi Chintaks. Their concern was not with God, their concern was what, what could possibly be the ultimate truth. What could be the absolute reality? And what is our place? That is why I often say that of the six systems of Hindu philosophy, five are technically atheist. They are not talking about Ishwar. They are talking about, once again, the Paramarthic Chintaks, great thinking. So there was this philosophy. And lastly, and if I may just answer your question as I say often on TV debates, in 30 seconds more. <laughs> Lastly, I felt there is a need today. There is a need today for Hindus as they face a new form of aggression in the religion, as they face self-appointed evangelists who say this alone is Hindu. <laughs> it is important for them to, to explain to them the profundity of thought that underpins this religion. The sheer size of the canvas that defines the, 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 the power of original thought, Nolik Soch, that underpins Hinduism. The dialogic nature of this religion, its eclecticism, its inclusiveness, its ability to debate called Shastra, it's important to understand all this. And I thought the best template to do that was to go to one of its greatest minds, Adi Shankar. Particular passage of quote from the Rigveda about the beginning of the universe. It must be yes. So amazing. Can you read it down? Sure. You know, the, the, the Rigveda is written sometime a thousand years before the common era. And look at the illumination. It is not a fiat, it is not a diktat, it is not. The, the assertion of certitude. It is the exploration, the interrogation, the asking of the question of what could possibly be. And it says there was neither non-existence nor existence there. There was neither the realm of space nor the sky which is beyond what stirred. Where? In whose protection? Was there water bottomlessly deep? There was neither death nor immortality then. There was no distinguishing sign of night and day. That one, Tat Tom Asiya, the Upanishad would say, that one breathed, windless by its own impulse. Other than that, there was nothing beyond. And then the next question, it's so important. We are the foundational text. Who really knows? Who will here proclaim it? Whence was it produced? Whence is this creation? The gods came afterwards with the creation of this universe. 
who then, who then knows whence it has arisen? Whence this creation has arisen? Perhaps it formed itself or perhaps it did not. The one who looks down on it in the highest heaven, only he knows or perhaps he does not. It's so brilliant. Because it's not asserting anything. It's not laying down a creation. You're just saying these are the possibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one thing I saw when I uh, read, read your book was that you must have found it very difficult to actually find out things about him because there are no historical records at all. And, and there's a lot of myth making. In fact, some of the myths are quite funny. Um, like, uh, apparently this young Adi Shankaracharya wants to become an ascetic and he's already lost his father and the mother says, no, you can't leave. And then he goes into the river to have a bath. And you continue the story. <laughs> well, you know, uh, obviously he showed signs of, as, I mean, signs of being a renunciate very early. He was a child prodigy. <coughs> and his father died, his mother was a widow, he was the only child, mother didn't wish him to renounce the world. And so now the story goes. Story, fable, mythology, anecdote, reinforce a central point and illustrate. Their value is in the illustration of an essential truth or a historical fact. So the story goes that he's in the river and he shouts out to his mother to say that my, a crocodile has caught my foot <laughs> and I'm about to be pulled under and the only thing that can save me is if you say, yes, I give you permission. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Hobson's choice in the scene. says. She says, he says, don't delay, there's no time. And she says, yes. And that's how he gets his permission. And similarly, there are all, you see, the whole thing about Hinduism is that the greatest harm you can give, you can do to Hinduism is to simplify it to a level where you lose the nuanced and beautiful tapestry of complexity which is one of the characteristics of ancient civilizations. Well, that would take everything literally. Literally. Yeah. But she, you see, the, his parents, Shankaracharya's parents, for a long time did not have a child. And then, according to hagiographies, yeah. Shiva appears and he says, you can have a child, but you have a choice. Now, once again, a choice. You can have, you will have a child, who will be adored but will live for very long. Or a child who will be a genius beyond the definition of genius, but will live a short life. What would you choose? And it's an illustrative question. And she says she would like the intelligent child and he dies at 32. But these are the kind of things that keep repeated in stories. But to your question, uh, about writing about his life, now, 